warfare. Is that right? Is that what what, what yeah. the, is that was that what the topic was? The resurgence of modern war, warfare or something like that? Yeah, and I'm and I'm recording this, so I've gone ahead and started recording. So wonderful, wonderful. Okay, that's cool. Well, uh, so I guess the first thing we should do is introduce uh, our guests. So we have Mitch Land. And Mitch is a uh, well-qualified uh, both Scotch and bourbon drinker, and uh, enjoys the occasional beer as well. Mitch is a, a, no, a noted—I'll call you new—but uh, new designer, war game designer, relatively speaking. Uh, designer of the Next War series and Silver Bayonets. Uh, so uh, just released a new title called Vietnam. So uh, oh, Next War Vietnam. So be so welcome. Hello. Yeah. And uh, then we got Fabrizio. Where did he go? Vianello. We, did we lose him? There he is. He's coming just in on the left, bottom left hand side for me, anyway. Fabrizio is an interesting cat. He uh, is an uh, Italian who moved to France and decided that uh, his most favorite game, the Next War series, was uh, the Next War from SBI 1970s era. Uh, a Mark Herman design was was the bee's knees, but didn't do it all. So uh, he recreated the that system and evolved it into quite the monster, and has now got two volumes out in that. Uh, plus, he's also reinvented the old uh, fifth core system and made it somewhat of a sophisticated simulation as well. So welcome, Fabrizio, and I think we lost you again, but. We'll let you get back. <laughs> it's all good. My name's Kevin. Uh, I got the little icon there. I'll try and bring my camera up in a second. But uh, so, well, Mitch, we're going to start with you, mate, because okay. you're here. And uh, Rizzo said he's having mic problems. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all right. Well, if he can reboot, that's cool. It's not not, not a problem for Rizzo. We'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> but I I was thinking about uh, the the to our topic and wondering how how it came to be that this this literally this resurgence from for board war gaming in particular has just kind of exploded and there's so many additional titles or is that really true is that really the case what do you think for modern era yeah for modern era yeah, yeah i you know i've been thinking about it since you since you asked uh to me to do this and you know part of me thinks it's nostalgia so a lot of us well, I'll speak for myself. A lot of us grew up in the Cold War era, right? right. Um, and so we see these games and and, and that ish that that time, and we want to we want to fight that battle, right? That never right. happened, thankfully. But um, which is different from the Next War series, to be to be clear, right? So yes. um, Next War, which became under an iron sky, right, with Fabrizio's guiding hand. That's that's Cold War stuff, right? But we've yeah. seen a lot of new new Cold War games coming out. Um, my next War series <clears throat> is obviously a little bit more future based, um, but still, I think I think both of them. So the one just shares nostalgia, but I think the other one is more um, for the same reason those games were popular at that time, right? Is the what if and what could happen, and let me go figure that out. And so we're seeing that, and I think. Um, a lot of it is just general nostalgia because you can see Compass is putting out a bunch of the games that we, again, I'm speaking for myself, that we grew up with, right? The reprinting editions, the reprinting versions of the games. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's just we're old enough now to have money to buy them again or <laughs> what it is, but it does seem to be, um, it does seem to be a growing part of it. I don't know if it's, I mean, resurgence is a good word. I don't know if we're going to overtake the world with those kinds of games. But, you is know, it, it, it's not Waterloo or The Bulge or yeah. Gettysburg. It, it's interesting as, as the years uh, it, it's interesting as the years march on from World War II and we get further and further away from World War II, you start to ask your, have to ask yourself, what what is modern war? I mean, is it just anything <laughs> after World War II? Is it ever, anything after Korea? Hey, don't be stealing my thunder. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, no, there's, I, there's actually, that question, I, yeah. Right? Yeah, right. I absolutely agree with you because I would, I would characterize that you know modern war, <laughs> whatever you want to, whatever label you want to put. So there's there was a definite shift between Korea and Vietnam, right? Um, yes. The, the weapons changed, the weapon systems weapons changed. Just tactics. thinking in general about how to mm -hmm. conduct war changed, I think. Um, and then now you fast forward 
to the present time. And I mean, just look at the recent war in, in Azerbaijan and um, Armenia, right? Drone, drone swarms. You know, uh, there's a lot of cyber, there's a lot of social media warfare going on, right, um, to, to shape the narrative. Um, and that's even moved beyond the, um, the, the war on terror. I mean, I, I think it's a horrible name, but um, that kind of uh, counterinsurgency. Off. I would still say, you know, the Vietnam War and the Korean War, uh, modern conflicts, they're post-World War II conflicts. Uh, and then you've got then you've got all the 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 smaller events and you've got civil wars that occurred and and all of that type of stuff. I think that that we have all seen and read about and experienced. My they're God. a different type of modern warfare as well. They're a they're at a, a different sure. different scale and a different level and a different uh, different types of equipment and tactics. And, uh, but, but I think the game designer, you know, game designer is grabbing onto those titles. Like there's a, there's a cool little title, the, the Battle for the Donatesk Airfield, right? That's a little 11 by 17 <laughs> map, cute little game and it works and good mechanics. I think part of it is innovation with mechanics too, that that's driving interest, not just that it's topical, but that there's an interest in in how the games are being presented to people uh, and, the, and the way they're interfacing with the games. So is it chip pull or is it blocks or is it, uh, is it something more sophisticated? Okay, in, it should in be the, okay now. The sequencing. Here he is, Fabrizio. Yay. So we, Yay. We're close. Right. Yeah, it's one one o'clock actually. One o'clock. One o'clock. Oh, what what a time! Yeah. So, are you oh, having uh, some wine? No, uh, coffee. coffee. Only coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I'm a I'm a night owl, so it's uh, really not a problem. Okay, that's great. That's <laughs> that great. Coffee. So we were just talking about we were just talking about the, the definitions of the 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 hypotheticals where your where your designs fit in uh, hypothetical World War Three versus the sort of near future uh, concepts that uh, Mitch has been working on with Next War Vietnam and Korea, Taiwan, India, Pakistan, all of those. And we're just talking about the difference in those and, and wonder if you had an opinion on why why there's an interest in modern warfare and the, and the hypotheticals. Uh, well, uh, actually, I've, I've tried to think about that, but uh, I think that one of the main point uh, is uh, um, nothing new is uh, nostalgia uh, mm -hmm. because uh, 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 our our whole uh, hobby is uh, is made basically for the main part by uh, people in the fifties more or less and uh, so we we all grew up uh, during the Cold War uh, we we all grew up uh, under 
the, the threat of a nuclear war uh, incoming. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's, of course, is something that uh, stay with you, uh, probably for, mm. for, your, for your whole life. And uh, moreover, uh, we, 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 never, uh, we never knew how, how it was going to end. Uh, because uh, uh, for 45 years we had the two most powerful armies uh, of the world uh, uh, facing each other and uh, uh, making plans uh, uh, for uh, for defeating the other. Uh, and after 45 years, uh, in uh, a couple of years, poof, everything simply disappeared. And so. Uh, off. Yeah, there is a still probably, uh, I'm talking about me, of course, there is still a, a voice inside me that is still saying, uh, uh, okay, but how does it end? Uh, who is going to win? Who's that, gonna that, win? That, that, that's the point. <laughs> and so I want to know. I want to know. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons. Know. Yeah, I don't know if maybe you agree with me, and I don't. I, you know, I haven't done Cold War stuff. My mind, as we talked about, is is future. But I would say the scholarship that's available now on the Cold War era is better than it was then, right? right. And so now we have better information about how those armies would have performed in that combat. And so that that I think is also feeding into the hey, let's redo this game or rethink about this, mm -hmm. you know, central front battle or whatever you think. But let's use the latest scholarship to give you a really good and so that's why it's funny because you see people arguing well should we set it in 1987 or 1985 or 19 you know what was the um mmp iron, um, iron curtain right it's 1945 19 i don't know what the actual years are 45 right? 64 62, 65, 62 85 and 89 yeah, yeah. You, can, you can so you can kind of see the progression of all that because they've got all the scholarship to do that and so you know yeah, yeah the nato yeah. might have won in I'll make it up because I, I I don't know, but NATO might have won in '62, but not in '74 or whatever, right? Right. Um, well, we used to build we used to build our scholarship on uh, go this this type of thing, right? The third world the third world war and John Hackett, yeah, yeah. and the old the Red <laughs> Army, the Bible, right? Red, Storm, Red Bible, Army, right? and and That's if you were really on. lucky, so, someone did David Isby's right, uh, right. Yeah. Soviet uh, forces and and but but look at you know one of the things that i get excited about there you go now we're, now we're doing this stuff right yeah now we're doing the real yeah uh, and this one too armies of the central front right yeah. Camp Isby, <laughs> right. yeah exactly right so it's interesting to me that the uh when you when you get some of these new these titles that have been manufactured or created or published in the last five six seven years and they're leveraging off either current relatively current technologies or even the 80s technology sitting around and playing with those with that fresh history that fresh perspective is really fun like the mvt and uh, getting to play with the canadians and the germans and what they the m1a ones and what their tanks were like and what the leos mm -hmm. were like it's just it's kind of it's kind of crunchy and it's kind of interesting i i like i like that stuff oh i love mvt i think it's a great great game um i have house rules so, but you know yeah don't what we you all. do right <laughs> but uh but i but i but i but i yeah i agree because you, you know again we have the data right we know relatively within bounds of reason what the armor was on those particular tanks what the penetrating value of a round was and then you know we can use math to figure out okay yeah. if i shoot at you at two thousand meters or whatever then this is probably the likely outcome and have a percentile die roll for that so it's great do so, you uh do you guys God. think that the the Israeli Arab wars drove a lot of interest in in war gaming for for the modern for the modern era? There was a slew of games at one point in the eighties that then that came out, and then there was literally nothing until like Yom Kippur from you know on the SCS titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, as, as sad as it is to say, I think the shooting war always drives interest, right? Because now we have, again, we now we have data, we have things to look at, and people always want to refight. This, that's why we refight the same battles over and over and over. And so people, you know, I think want to take a stab at it. Um, 
so yeah, absolutely. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah, as Miss said, uh, the other thing is that uh, we have uh, now a lot more information about uh, about uh, how the Soviet uh, war machine uh, uh, actually worked, uh, what they consider the, the strong points of yep. NATO and the weak points of NATO, and it's uh, of course it's it's much easier to to uh, to put up a simulation uh, than, uh, than what is in, uh, in the 80s or in the 70s when uh, James Dunnigan uh, had probably to um, dig information, uh, I have no idea where, uh, for, uh, for knowing uh, the, uh, the, the category of each uh, Soviet division. It's uh, something, uh, it, must have been, it must have been crazy probably in the 70s <laughs> right. to uh, a lot of work really you know, yeah it's I, interesting go ahead no, was, I was gonna say, good. my reason for asking uh, you know how you define modern war uh, had an ulterior motive and and that was you know sometimes you you read about uh, 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 people who uh, with more recent conflict uh, have ethical issues with uh, being able to play wars that they might have fought in you know, play games that simulate wars that that are, that are so recent, like Afghanistan or Iraq, where the, the, there's people say, "Well, I feel uncomfortable either designing or playing in a game that's too modern, right? That's right. still being fought." So I'd be interested I, to know uh, what your, your I, experience is there. I I say I had a very tough time getting into Labyrinth for the first time, right? Especially as the jihadist player when my goal was to put WMDs into the U.S., right, or even into Europe. Right. Um, I have since gotten past that. It, it is a, it, I think it's a good, solid game. It teaches some interesting things about the way to think about the war on terror. Although, again, I think that's a stupid name or a stupid term, but kind of like the war on drugs, but we won't go into that. But, um, you know, is it, is, an, is it an exact simulation? No. But, yeah, absolutely, I had issues... Um, playing that particular game. Although, honestly, I didn't have any issue playing uh, a distant plane. I love that game. I think it's a pro I, hey, I, so if we're going to like rank all the coin games, and I don't want this to be a GMT ad or anything, but if we were going to rank coin games, I love the distant plane over every other coin game out there. Just whatever it is, I think it captures the subject really well. And it just, right. it plays, you know, plays well. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is I think it's also the longest playing coin game out there. Other than glad maybe said, I'm glad you said that because it's sitting, <laughs> sitting right there unopened uh, uh, at my feet. So, uh... Yeah. 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 I mean, you you got to have three other dedicated friends who want to play that one because it's a right. six, eight hour uh, extravaganza. But uh, yeah, hey, that's, what yeah, vassal, that's what they make Vassal for, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, but, and and I, I, uh, I, Mike Dunn out at uh, uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and I. Hey, Mike. Uh, hey, Mike. Hey, good to see you again. Hey, for video. You know, hey, guys. Um, I also bounced off of uh, distant plane, but not because of any emotional issues, but because the uh, the way Volko Runke modeled it did not jibe up with my experience of being in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which did not jibe up with any of my other students' experience with Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that we were getting queasy about playing uh, in a war we actually fought in. It was just that our own war experiences were so vastly different from the model that we really weren't able to do that suspension of disbelief. Interesting. Right. Well, and and I think, I think there's a danger, right. In, in trying to model a conflict that is so new, right. Of, of how do you capture the essence of it when we really, and Mike, I know you come from a particular um, perspective on that, but ha have we really captured the lessons on that conflict, right? I mean, now, granted, we've been in Afghanistan for a long time now. Hopefully, we've captured the lessons from that. But absolutely, when a distant plane came out, maybe not, right? I must say that my, my only problem in playing uh, a, a side uh, or a period uh, was uh, with, uh, it's um, almost incredible to say, to say that uh, today but it was in playing with the soviets uh, mm. i spent uh, probably 20 years playing uh, uh, only the nato side mm. and uh, when we started to develop uh, under a narrow sky uh, of course we, we need some some of them taking the soviets right. and so uh, i made my first attempt with the soviet and uh, 
something snapped. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I don't know. Mm. And from uh, from that uh, that uh, the first time, uh, I I really love them. <laughs> no. well, there there are, are a lot of problems, a lot of stuff. Know, I, you have to I, I know a guy, Fabrizio. To your point, he will only play the. Yeah, quote unquote good guys. Yeah, I, yeah. I was, right. was going to say there are people that won't play Germans in World War II right. for that. Right. Yeah, reason. yeah. He, oh. And he gets torn when it's a when it's a with an East, Eastern Front game, so he just throws up his hands. It doesn't play Eastern Front games, right? But, that's interesting. Yeah. So so that's that kind of brings up a point about uh, sides. Uh, that <laughs> there was a so the fan. Uh, what was it called? Dang it! Nuts Publishing. Phantom Fury? Was it Phantom Fury? The oh, Solitaire yeah. thing? The Fallujah. Right? Mm-hmm. Fallujah. I love right? that game, but yeah. Yeah, fantastic game, right? So, it was, you know, tactical... Ex- One of the few Solitaire and, games I actually like, but yeah. But uh, yeah, well, so you, but it gave you decisions to make, so Correct. it makes it valuable, right? Versus you being mm-hmm. be activator of the AI. But anyway, uh, I had a, a buddy who's a, a, a vlogger, and he, he can, will not and cannot still play any title that has anything to do with Fallujah. Really? He was, he was a Marine. Yep. He was there. Third herd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, being there, done that. Right. So, right. you know, there's, there's a, there's a sensitivity, I think, to, to titles, but uh, if they're handled well, I think that's, I think it's okay. Right. I don't know. I, I it's, I'm not, it's not going to be for everybody, but, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I, given given the climate, I mean, even even games on the American Civil War or, of course, um, you know, things like that could be touchy for some people, yep, right? Yep, I mean, yeah. And we, I can respect that, but I think uh, mm-hmm. I think a designer ha- should have the right to go and do what he wants to do and design what he wants to design, and it's our choice to sure. decide whether we want to play that and make it a commercial su- success or not, as the case may be. But uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so now, with the two with the two of you here, uh, you is there a is there a is this going to be your only focus for war gaming? I, I, Mitch, I know you play a lot of uh, a pre a pre Napoleonic and Napoleonic titles, and mm-hmm. Fabrizio, I know you have an interest in ancient history, but you're yep. not where 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 definitely so what, yeah. Uh, so so. Why haven't you designed either of you designed games in the uh, pre-modern warfare era? Because uh, you, you're both, you know, here's his. Uh, However, you want to define it, right? Right. You know, uh, so you answer you these, two, these two big guys here, right? <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 look at the size of this freaking thing. Deadly <laughs> the knife. That's a big ass box. <laughs> I'll do the camera. Yeah, uh, yeah. But besides of a box, was one of the first thing uh, we have to decide, and we have no experience at all. So it right. was uh, practically <laughs> random. Well, <laughs> we just uh, thought about uh, no, we want a big box, big box. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can put all the counter trays in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say your box is kind of small, buddy. But don't. But we won't put that again. <laughs> hey, my game fits in the box. I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> anyway, so answer your answer, the, uh, Fabrizio. What is? Uh, will you ever design titles outside of the modern warfare era? Uh, yeah, yeah. As you said, my second interest uh, is uh, is the ancient ancient history, mm-hmm. and uh, so I, I think that. Uh, when the 1985 series uh, will be over, that it is it's a, it's still uh, one module to go. And Second after, order, uh, right? Yeah, and after the, the the C3 series will be over, that will take probably uh, two years or more. And after that, uh, I would like to do something in the in the ancient history period. Wonderful. Actually, I I already something. Uh, I have already something in mind, but uh, just keep my mouth shut. For yeah, for that's great. Right. No, I, I, I was more curious. That's a good idea. Yeah, I was more curious. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't say anything because I think the two of you have, uh, and the reason why the reason why the two of you are here tonight is not because uh, I suck at inviting other 
in, 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 industry, industry luminaries. I, I gave you plenty of time. I gave you plenty of time. Yes. You had plenty of time, my friend. Yeah, right. Although I do kind of start inviting luminaries, uh, you know, Mark Simonich didn't want to come, but hey, you know, what can I say? Um, the, That's a Mark thing, though. He doesn't do podcasts. No, I know. I, I, I'm just, I'm just teasing. It's more so yeah. I can get, I get a dig at a Mark. But um, right. But I, I, the two of you, I think it, when I look at all the game titles that have come out that have generated sort of passionate, frenzied excitement about the modern war era, it, and when I, I'm talking about hypothetical World War Three, about your style of game, it's you know, uh, I think. You two have probably been the most uh, influential in that era, in those, it, and in this time, you have seen a lot of people go, "Hmm, I should make me a modern game and get some shit out there because there's uh, stuff going on." Right now, right, we do have had some coin stuff, and uh, Distant Plane is great, and Brian Train is kind of like the unsung hero of mm -hmm. uh, modern modern war gaming at at uh, sort of the desktop publishing and then with the occasional game made through other publishers but he hasn't had sort of a breakout what we call breakout success that if even the two of you have had and i think he's a fantastic right. designer he does mm -hmm. a great job of asymmetric Thank design. You. yeah so but you guys have really driven a lot of the excitement and passion around around these uh these games so, so why uh, we've talked to, you've said nostalgia and interest in what ifs but isn't the world actually really kind of a much safer quieter place today than it has been perhaps in the last 10 15 years other than russia's a little bit of uh, adventurism going sure. on there's not a lot going on i mean technically yeah i mean you know i've seen the stats and i don't remember who puts that out but um you know that's what they say is that it's actually safer now than it ever has been that there are fewer yeah. wars going yeah. on whatever um, yeah, let me, let, let, obviously, keep talking, some of us are a little more blessed in some Western countries than in others. But yeah, keep keep talking. I want to see if I can uh, sure show this. Um, I mean, this is a very wide ranging question. I, you know, I have I, I have ideas in my head. Um, for me, it's about and, and I I recently posted about this and something I don't remember where it was, but somebody was asking, you know, well, should I make this kind of a game or this kind? Of game? I'm like, well, you need to make the game that you want to play. And that's when it comes to the next yep. four series, they've always been the games that I want to play. I love all of you, but I don't care if you want to play the game. I want to play the game. I want that game to come out in paper and cardboard so that I can play it. <laughs> you know? My um, same well, thought. My exactly. same thought. I, my, Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next, next question I was going to ask was, what motivates you to design a particular game? Is it is it you look at you look at yeah. like, you know in the in the corollary of it's that passion, right? The corollary of that was you know is there a modern era conflict that that hasn't been gamed enough or that that you know, is, yes. there, is there, what would you, uh, and this is directed to each of you in turn, you know, what, mm -hmm. what conflict do you think needs another game? You know, to, to, to where, uh, where it hasn't that's been a done. That's a good in, question. Hasn't yeah. been done in, in so, enough detail, it, it, but warrants, but warrants a game. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I don't want to steal anything from, from uh, Fabrizio, but for me, it's the Falklands. I want to do mm. the definitive game on the Falklands. Right, and the problem is it is so difficult because it's such a weird war. Right, keep uh, keep one copy for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. No, uh, oh, another God, interest. You know. uh, that's a that's a that's a that's a challenging one because there's that there's that whole naval aspect I, to the game and the air, aircraft attacking the ships, and then there's the ground combat. So there's a lot right. of there's you could you could write and, you could write a naval game and you could write a land right. game. In this and, and it's about the it's about the macro to the micro and and there's a lot of what ifs. I mean, it, you know, the Argentines could have done a lot of different things, which made the outcome totally different. They just right. didn't for whatever reason, right? So, <laughs> and that's that's the the thing for me is how do you capture the essence of that but still stay true to the history, right? So I, I noodle on that every now and then. I you know haven't done the serious reading yet. I've got some of the reading done, but not all of it because I've been distracted. <laughs> but, yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, to answer the, the director, it's about passion for me, right? What what am I? What topic am I passionate about at the time? Yeah. Now, for me, uh, I think there are probably two wars that are not yet well covered. Uh, the first is the Algerian uh, independence war, 
Mm. Uh, that is a very interesting one, a uh, very complicated one, a very bloody one too, mm -hmm. and uh, with a lot of political aspects, of course. And that one is uh, something that I really loved. I also have a, a local expert here in France uh, about the, the Algerian war, so it would be really nice to, to do something on that. And the second area is the, the Central American conflicts. Uh, I remember there was a, a, a game, of maybe from Victory Games. Uh, Central America. Yeah, that one, <laughs> exactly. That I was, have two uh, copies, you want me to show you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I tried to approach a couple of times. Uh, I, I also played uh, some uh, smaller scenarios, uh, the scenarios with the CIA uh, helicopters, mm -hmm. I remember, and so on. Um, and it was very interesting because uh, from, a, from a scale point of view, it's a very, are very small wars, but right. the, 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 the political consequences of that war uh, uh, are, are incredible. Uh, they're, a, they're a real mess. Uh, mm -hmm. So it will be a very, very interesting field to, to, to explore. Good, good stuff. I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes the smaller, smaller conflicts can generate a lot of tactical interest or, well, tactical interest, but also there's these geopolitical things that go on because you've got right. media, media impacting what's happening and you've got, uh, 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 you know, or sort of the proxy war thing happening as well and who's, who's supporting whom and all of that sort of business. I think, uh, Brian Train did the Ukraine was, uh, at one point, there's a title that he had. He did it through Hollenspiel, I think. And it had crisis. Real, you, Ukraine crisis. That's it. Yeah, it had this really interesting political track. So you had to keep mm. politic, political support up, but you still needed to win, win stuff on the ground, which meant right. breaking things and killing things. It's a fascinating right. uh, so, dichotomy. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so part of the issue with at least in in my perspective so my games they all start after the after the diplomacy is broken down right right, it, right. It, and it's gone to the shooting where there is a whole spectrum of activity that happens before that yeah. that i just i'm i'm hand waving right that's the strategic surprise tactical surprise and extended buildup. that's the hand waving of yeah there was all this gray man stuff and political stuff going on beforehand right. but right. at this point people said somebody said nah we're done start pulling the trigger right right um there i think there is a space out there that could be carved out for that part kind of like the um what's the lead up game for the uh world war ii stuff uh, days of days, decision days, i think days, yeah. yeah maybe so, so something like that but yeah. in a modern context of yeah. you know and probably best played as a card game but you know here's right. what i'm doing to set right. the stage yeah. for Let's go shoot stuff. Well, if, right? you're yeah. if you're really old school, Origins of World War II by Avalon Hill, right? That, what, maybe what, that's the one. Yeah, I'm yeah, thinking well, of. Really yeah, yeah. But that, that, yeah. but that leads not? to that leads to another really good question because uh, you guys both have designed a lot of games that are focused on what if wars, wars that haven't happened, hmm. right? Obviously, if you're designing a game like the Falklands or uh, Silver Bayonet or something like that, you've got you've got an order of battle. That it, that you could easily mm -hmm. look at history and say that's what was there, that's that's mm -hmm. who was com in command, you know. But when you're creating a war that hasn't happened, how do you, it be how do you decide, you know, what I mean? You, you can look at the historical record. You could maybe figure out, you know, what forces were where. Uh, if you have access to, you know, the National Archives, maybe you can see the orders that were issued and what position units were in those positions at the time you decide to start your war. The question is, I well, the dice. how do you decide about it? Well, <laughs> I roll the I'm, dice. I'm curious what I'm curious how I'm curious what techniques you each use to figure out, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in particular, uh, what forces to put on the map and when and how and you know, how how do you figure yeah, out how do, uh, you, how do you how do you how do you uh, uh, use your imagination or facts to figure out what the order of battles look like? Yeah, it's a, an interesting question because uh, for for a World War Three, uh, for the classical uh, NATO versus Warsaw Pact uh, World War Three, is probably simpler than for uh, than for 
image uh, creations that uh, are, uh, are in, in the near future. But for what the shit up, Fabrizio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so so he does have he does have in some rules in uh, next war Vietnam that you've got to choose where what is the hundred first airborne going to Taiwan, oh. Korea, or Vietnam, right? Yeah, it can't yeah. be in all three places. I thought that was great, right? <laughs> so uh, even for the NATO versus pact uh, conflict, you you have to to, to build up a, a global scenario and. Uh, Right. Uh, in, for example, in our games, uh, the, the global scenario is actually uh, all of the same. Uh, we, we don't have uh, uh, different scenarios for the C3 series and for the 1985 series. The global scenario is uh, exactly the same. And uh, right. you have to evaluate, uh, of course, what, which uh, uh, possible historical courses uh you, you you know and uh, you you find in the archives uh, and so on and after that uh, you, you you have to play around a little and uh, to find out if the historical course or the historical plan uh, that you know of uh, was actually feasible uh and uh, if it's not you you have to to adjust somehow uh for example it was quite difficult to, to decide how the Warsaw Pact was going to organize uh, uh, his uh, fronts in a central European offensive, because uh, some of the suggestions uh, uh, we found in, uh, in some documents uh, uh, were simply not going to work. Uh, so uh, they, they, they were not possible. Uh, if you use the, the suggested plan, uh, you don't have, for example, enough forces uh, in South Germany. Uh, so you, you have to balance things uh, somehow. And in the end, I think uh, we, we found out uh, a plausible plan that uh, we are using as a global scenario for our, uh, our World War Three games. So what, I'm, so what I'm hearing Mitch, is it requires. You have uh, comments on that you might. I was going to say what I'm hearing is it requires more gray matter and more consumption of alcohol to come up with a, when they come up nah. with a game that that isn't based on history. But yeah. you, ha we have right. to do, you have to do more right. research and more guesswork and more uh, uh, interpolation. Of, sure. Of, uh, of stuff yeah. to come up with a plausible. You don't want to be too implausible with your with your right. global scenario, otherwise it's science fiction. Sure. Right? Right. Science fiction. You can. I you mean, cannot. Right. You I mean, cannot. So, yeah. Right. I mean, at least Fabrizio gets access to declassified documents and stuff. You know, I'm going off of Wikipedia, and you know, there there are some some reputable organizations out there, like the um, International Institute for Strategic Studies. We use our we use I use them as a. Okay, here's what Wikipedia says. Here's what the IIS I. IISS says about what that nation has as of right now. Um, the problem with IISS is it's not real specific, right? It's not 1st Battalion, 1st Brigade, 10th Division, right? It's, they have 22 battalions in their infantry, and they have these, and they have that, and they have that. So you kind of have to yeah. extrapolate between all the publicly available information. Um, and sometimes I do have access to, to some folks who are in the know. I'm like, hey, is this reasonable? And they'll say, yes, or meh, no. And that's about as far as they can go, right? right. Um, in a, and so it's it, at the end of the day, it's the best guess. But that, but that's why I, you know I've started to do the supplements of hey, you know what? Stuff's changed since 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 games have been published. So here's here's the new way that Nation X is thinking about their army or whatever it is, you know, or the new stuff that they bought. So here you go. Here's the new counter set. So. Yeah, I think that I think that supplemental approach is pretty interesting, actually, because it gives you a, a it gives, it's an additional revenue source, which is nice. <laughs> but it, but it gives you it gives you a chance to extend the life of the game. Well, yeah, well, you know, I mean, twenty bucks, twenty bucks is twenty bucks. I know what we won't talk about. We won't talk about cost production, right? But uh, it's, but it gives you an opportunity to extend the life of the game. To right. it, particularly, we look at uh, your second uh, supplement with the insurgents. Mm -hmm. That's you may as well just it's a completely different game right correct uh, now absolutely right so so it 
completely change it. So you, you're, it's like a, having a whole, literally a whole new series to play, right. and go back and start all over again. So that's fascinating. On the flip side of all that, you, you also can just quickly go, you know what, I kind of screwed up or, or we got led astray on the F-35s or, you know, whatever, whatever right. it is, right? But as, of course, as that matures over time, Right. I think you see yeah, if there's if there's one plane in the system that's changed over time, it's the F thirty five. And honestly, it's I've you know I've actually talked to the project manager on part of the F thirty five, and it's just you know it's one of those things. Of, well, I don't want to go into it too much, but you know yeah. that's the rating that I think it deserves. Kind yeah. Of deal, right. So. And it's also teething problems with the system, right? Sure. Right. I mean, the F four sucked when it first came out. Let's right. be honest. Right. So. Right. right. Um, they'll get it right eventually, yeah. like everything else. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, which led me to another question, which I have now forgotten. So someone should jump in and ask a question. <laughs> what about the audience? Well, yeah, I, yeah, well, I think what I'm gonna say. Yeah, let's throw it out to the audience. Does anybody have a, uh, uh, another question? Oh, wait, there's an audience? Yeah, yeah there's an audience. I mean, we're actually having... <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, other than Mike. Hey, uh, yeah, well, actually, there's this, five copies. Copy. I'm sorry. Um, my question is actually to you, uh, Mitch, is what sort of challenges are you running into with incorporating not so much the uh, new technologies, but uh, some of the more new doctrinal concepts? Yeah, so that's a problem because, you know, and I talk about this in a, in a couple of different things, but it's like, how do you distill a doctrinal change into a rule? Because at the end of the day, that's what it needs to be, right? Um and so a lot of it ends up baked into the ratings or the um, sequence of play or something like that. But, you know, drone strikes for, for, for the next war series, drone strikes are kind of rolled into that whole ballistic missile strike concept or an HQ strike concept of right. it doesn't really matter what the technology is. It's just what's the game effect. Right. And so that's that's. That's how I handle it. Um, part of the issue is keeping up with all the doctrinal changes, for sure. Um, I can read it. So I, it's just, yeah, I'm sure. Um, but a lot of it, but a lot of it just boils down to at the, at the end of the day, it's you know, still about boots on the ground and and um, where they're at in relation to other folks, right? So some of that doesn't sure. change from a from a game perspective, um, and. You know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying. There's that whole pregame situation that builds up to the when the shooting war starts. Once the shooting war starts, even given the most recent um, activity in, in uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, yes, they used drone strikes, right? But at the end of the day, there were infantrymen firing rifles and there were tanks going around shooting people and planes right. dropping bombs, right? So some of the basics don't change. Um, some of the some of the other aspects go into the um I, you know for the next war series to be captured in the efficiency rating so armies that are doctrinally used to using information space better are going to have a higher efficiency rating. right that's a great catch-all in your system i think right I, I'll, yeah. I'll i'll make the embarrassing confession that i'm not familiar with any of these games that you two have developed <laughs> so uh but I will ask you this, and 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 I'm and I'm caveating that my question on that because if I probably read the rules for the games, I'd have my answer. How have you handled NBC, and how altering NBC could be in the situation? Does NBC just end the game because of the political ramifications of its use, or is NBC factored in as a significant, you know, combat multiplier uh, in your game? Ritzy, you go first because I know Under an Iron Sky has a large section on that. Yeah, yeah. No, um, actually, I think it, it, it's a, a big uh, uh, weapon and uh, force multiplier. It's a big force multiplier, but of course, it's it's uh, subject to a, a series of political considerations that uh, cannot be avoided. Uh, there are several uh, several players, uh, several grognars that looks. Uh, I'm sure that uh, World War Three with the uh, Warsaw Pact uh, will have gone nuclear immediately. Uh, the, uh, um, I don't think so. I think that uh, it would it would have been a, a very difficult choice for both sides to to escalate to uh, nuclear or uh, chemical uh, chemical warfare. 
so in uh, under an narrow sky and uh, in a C3 to you, um, there are limits to um, there are rules that try to limit uh, a, an easy use uh, of this kind of weapons. But uh, if you start using them, uh, they are absolutely a, a terrifying, uh, a terrifying force multiplier to a point that uh, in uh, there are some uh, scenarios uh, that in the C3, in the C3 series, the scenarios called uh, One Minute to Midnight. And this, in this scenario, uh, both sides can use uh, nuclear or, uh, or chemical weapons with no restraints since the start. Uh, and the problem was to write down to find out the victory condition plausible victory condition for this kind of scenarios <laughs> because there is uh, yeah. there is no way uh, you, you can have you cannot have a marginal victory uh, mm -hmm. what's a marginal victory you, you have conquered 100 kilometers of wasteland wow yeah, yeah. Yeah. so uh, I, 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 the victory is the only choice I, I nuked uh, Hamburg, but not Dusseldorf, uh, so I win, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah not so good. Oh, but, you know, Hamburg is such a nice city. I it visited, uh, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of times. So, uh, it's very it's a fantastic red light district. By yes. I, I know nothing about that. I, 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 I like the world. I like the world in miniature. You can't. You, you have to see the world in mini the miniature uh, miniature world there at Hamburg to yeah. really appreciate it. You know, yeah. Go ahead, go so ahead, some man. of the some of the, I would say some of the sides in in the next war series have access to chemical weapons. Usually the bad side, right? Because most most nations have forsworn chemical weapons, right? And so we we assume that yeah, they actually have destroyed all their chemical chemical munitions, like they said they did. Um, the the one issue comes up with nuclear weapons. So you see it a lot in India, Pakistan, and even Poland. Um, you know, if some of the supplemental rules, uh, the DPRK can use nukes. Right. Um, you know, the U.S. has a no no first use policy, basically, um, but we reserve the right to change that at any time. So whatever that means. Right. right. Um, but, you know, the way I handle it was kind of like the way Third World War did. There's a, a lighter fluid rule. <laughs> Every time you put a marker down and you successfully resolve it, you roll a die. If you roll too low, guess what? It's a, game over. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so well, it's a little bit of a break on it. But, you know, some people. So attack. what's really interesting Exactly. So what's really interesting, and when I went out to the Marine War College, the first thing they wanted to do, nuke somebody. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to nuke that task force. All right, go ahead. Here's the consequence. Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. So, um, so that was the first time I went out there. So this just all, all, but the second time I went out there was really funny because so they were playing a combined Korea, Poland, Taiwan game. And the guys that were in the Korea theater, the North Koreans started using chemical weapons. And the um, the folks playing the the South Koreans and the and the U.S. and the Allies there were like, we have no response. We have no valid response other than nuking them. That's the only thing they could respond with. So like, well, and the the conversation was fascinating around. Well, we don't want to nuke the Chinese because they have nukes. So we're going to just nuke the Koreans, the, the North Koreans that are over here, and we're going to make sure we nuke them in North Korea, not South Korea. So I mean, the, just the conversation around it was fascinating and i think that's the that's the point i think we're trying to drive home is there needs to be consequences and you need to really think about those kinds of decisions right right about right. when to use those kinds of weapons or if you use those kinds of weapons so, so wasn't it joel toppin that uh was doing the videos at one point it was on twitter i think he, and then he, i think he collected them all up but he nuked the u.s task force as it came into yep. the gulf of both both the or whatever it's called whatever that uh, the uh -huh. What, yeah, in Poland, yeah, uh, north Where? of Poland, and <laughs> and he nuked, nuked that task force, and, and you know sunk sunk the carrier. And the Soviets like, yeah, that's awesome, and then rolls a two and game over right. there, game over. Right. nuclear right. Armageddon. So there's a price to pay for that type of thing. I did remember before we go on. I remember my question question I was going to ask. So in the Persian Gulf, uh, in the Persian Gulf game uh, from Frank Chadwick. GW 80s there's that fantastic set of cards and the loyalty and uh, allegiance track that moves as your card play moves the 
I think there's uh, like minor factions of uh, religious groups, and then there's the Israelis and the Iraqis and the the Kurdish and a number of other different forces, right? That oh. move. The, so it, it creates amazing replay value in a modern war game. I'm curious if that level of uh, abstraction slash and each of those also forces up the escalation point to war it's mm -hmm. kind of like pre-war game that you have right mm -hmm. fascinating gameplay i'm wondering if either of you have thought of using things of that nature in your game systems to to to, to recreate that sort of geopolitical tension uh, we 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 have something something similar in mind for our for the last uh, um, 1985 module uh, sacred oil that will cover the Soviet offensive in the Persian Gulf, right? And uh, uh, the Soviet offensive will be uh, like the rest of the series uh, in uh, July 1985, and right. so we are right in the middle uh, of the Iran-Iraq conflict. Mm. And uh, so it's a very complicated situation because uh, during the conflict, uh, everyone uh, was more or less allied uh, with the Iraqi, and uh, no one uh, was uh, was really friendly toward the, the toward Iran. Right. So right. what's going to, what's going to happen when uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, decide to to invade Iran? Uh, okay. So we will have uh, uh, some sort of loyalty uh, records, of loyalty score, uh, right. to, to show up uh, how the Iranians uh, uh, will be willing to accept and how fast they will be willing to accept, uh, for example, a U.S. help against the Soviets and how fast the U.S. will be willing to give uh, Iranian help against the Soviet. There are a lot of problems, you know, a lot of things. And another inter interesting aspect that we will, we will have that will be a sort of game of bluff and counter bluff. Uh, that's because uh, the, the, the Persian Gulf Offensive uh, it's actually a secondary front for the Soviet Union during World War III. And the main goal of the offensive is to uh, drain forces, uh, drain the U.S. forces like Europe. from, from right. Europe. Yeah. 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 And so the, the Soviet player, we have uh, a couple of choices to make in the pre-game. And the same thing is going to happen to the U.S. side that we have to decide uh, how many reinforcements is going to commit in, uh, in Persian Gulf. And uh, probably the side that gets the, 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 the right choice uh, will have a big advantage during, during the game. Yeah, that's a, that sounds interesting, you know, so could, because, you know, the 101st and the 82nd Airborne, and I guess the whatever was, whatever at that time, I think there was the concept of the light division was floating around as well. So yeah. you know, you've got those three formations and the B-52s out of uh, yep. uh, out of uh, the yeah, Diego Garcia. Garcia. So yep. that's all interesting stuff. Uh, and of course, I, I don't know if either of you have played uh, that Persian Gulf module, played it connected to the others, but it's a fascinating little way to ramp up the the tension level, and then boom, all of a sudden, oh, oh hell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's we're fantastic. At war, we're at war, and the Israelis aren't in, and the Saudis are out. And <laughs> that's not how I wanted things to go, right? It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. That's okay. like you know, in the next war series, that's all die roll based, right? Who who's coming yeah. on which yeah. side, or or you can pay VP to get the Commonwealth to join right with the Allies, but it's not like they're going to join in on the Viet or the Chinese side, right? So right. Uh, yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's also an equal, equally cool uh, uh, way to handle things there too. So that's how about that? But it's certainly easier. It's certainly easier. Well, well, this is this is uh, well, you know, the, it does add some turn turns in time. It does. You're playing cards and then you're moving things, and aircraft are moving, and things are going on, on right? So right. it is uh, it is a bit of a uh, 
extended gameplay. It's six or seven turns before you start the but mm -hmm. it can happen pretty quick and, and be over. Here. So Mitchell, I know you, stuff. Mitchell, I know you mentioned the war, the war college. Do you uh, have your war games been used for training purposes? Or I mean, they use them a if? couple times with yeah. their things mm -hmm. for sure, you know. And I know um, Mike might be able to speak more to this if it's been more broadly used, but I know it's been used in other places. You know, the thing of, the thing about it is, at the end of the day, it's still a game, right? right. You're not gonna you're not gonna learn how the right. first brigade of the second division is gonna actually act right. in, a, in a shooting situation, right? But it's more about learning the less big big picture lessons of. Yeah. Here's the terrain. What terrain portions are important? What other kinds of decisions are important? How how important are fires to the overall battle plan? You know what? How important is their superiority to the overall battle plan? Those kinds of things. Um, I've had this talk with the guys at the Marine War College. Is it's it's a lot more about how the scenario is set up to to teach them to learn the lessons of the what are the other things they need to be thinking about other than guys pulling the trigger, right? So how do you set the victory condition? What is victory? How does what does victory look like? Right? I mean, they were after playing that combined game, they were a little astonished just at the at the losses. And um, Doc Lacey was very quick to point out, you know, we have not experienced losses on that scale in a long time. Hmm. You know, so think about and the challenge was think about how do you explain that to the American public? If God forbid something were happened, how do you explain tens of thousands? Not and I don't want to diminish the fact uh, the losses that we have experienced and some of the, the things that we're involved in now, but how do you explain 10,000 a day as opposed to 10,000 over 10 years, right? right. It, that's, we've, we haven't had to do that in a long time. Right. So, you know, it kind of, it was a sobering, you know, like in all things, we did an AAR after the exercise and it was a very sobering discussion at that point. Of, yeah, you know, if you count up all the guys that were probably in this brigade or whatever, you know, we're talking about, Across the course of all three theaters, two, two or three hundred thousand losses on on both sides at minimum. Right. And that was just a, that was a sobering number, right? Unless unless you treated that as combat ineffective, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Just, there's a leg wound, there's a flesh wound. Yeah, I, I'll say, I'll say, <laughs> this guy couldn't really. <laughs> I'll say several years ago, I, uh, I had the misfortune, well, the misfortune of uh, attending somebody's estate sale, uh, and it was a, a mm. old time war, a war gamer here in Houston had been around a long time and uh one of the things i found in that estate sale was a army u.s army corps of engineers engineering war game so it was literally mm -hmm. done by the u.s army corps of engineers in the 80s it was hex based mm -hmm. you, you had a deck of cards that posed engineering questions and if you answered <laughs> the questions right you were able to move your assets on the map to to try, oh, wow. to, try to stop the <laughs> stone, stone so, right. yeah it, well, it, we'll it, look at you look at SBI, right? Uh, SBI's right. firefight. That was a ten thousand dollar order back in nine, in the nineteen seventies, which was a lot of money back then to yeah. build a, a, a game that made the uh, M one hypothetical tank look yeah, good. There's, there's a lot of interest on, on in in the part of the Department of Defense on war gaming now. Yeah. There's definitely a difference between commercial war gaming and professional war gaming, right? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You do, right. you, we, Most right. of the professional war gaming it requires umpires. It requires all kinds of things. Yeah. You know, it's we, not. It's, it's not a lot of geo uh, on the map, right? you, you, A lot of geopolitical stuff as well. Right? Yeah. You could do a right. whole another hour just discussing. Uh, yes. The military training aspects of war gaming, right? And creek spieling and all right. that. Right. Yeah. right. And, and, and don't get me wrong. There's value in in the whole range, right? Of breaking out something like combat commander and playing that, as opposed to playing. You know what was the one that ran recently? Hegemony or hegemony, hegemony or yeah, whatever, whatever the yeah, hell it was called. That's it, right? Yeah, um, which required a laptop and four umpires and three four umpires, umpires and four hundred ninety nine. Whatever, right? It's yeah. like, and that's yeah. not for commercial play, right? right? You're not going to get together with your buddies on Saturday night and play that. Yeah. But that that said, we find that the commercial games tend to be a lot better done than the uh, uh, professional games, and right. a lot of it because of the audience is a lot more demanding. Uh, it's right. true. Right. If you scratch a hobby gamer, you're going to find somebody that is far better versed in history and right. uh, the era than, I hate to say it, uh, uh, military professionals. So, right. Mike, that's a great point. And, uh, and I, I know we need to wrap up for the next session. But I, oh, yeah. on that point, the, the, the 
enthusiast modern modern war gamer has a higher expectation of i guess fidelity and history <laughs> and and all the rest of it oh yeah and they, all, they also beat the pants off most of the professional war gamers when they do get get into those war gaming sessions i recall reading an article Absolutely. <laughs> in, in a book or somewhere about, about that it may sound a bit uh yep. those boffins wrote but that was our hour, which went way too quick, and uh, I, I, I wish we had another hour to keep talking, but I know it's uh, 2 a.m. for Fabrizio, so I appreciate you being here, Fabrizio. No, I'm uh, okay. Uh, I'm just start working now. You're just going to get started, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fun. That's great. That's great. Yeah, and I know Persia, I mean, Persian Gulf map to do, so. There you hey, go. You better get on that, buddy. I'm yeah, on on behalf of want Tech, that out, uh, of and Mitch, thank you so much. Yeah, you're always yep. a, a, a pleasure to chat with, it. and uh, thanks for organizing thanks this, all. buddy. Yeah, on, on behalf, on behalf of Texas Broadside, Kev, thanks for organizing and uh, and moderating. Oh, so, yeah, I'm glad we could get a few people in. So what's wonderful. So yeah. thanks so much. All right, thanks, thanks, guys. All right, good night, all. All right. And we're still on. Okay. The war <laughs> yeah. The wargaming continues. So, uh, 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 let's see. It's 7 p.m. Central Time here in the U.S. A little after that, uh, we are going to uh, move on to a scenario of Check Your Six in Roll20. So, I don't know how many folks are here and want to play Roll20 uh, and play Check Your Six. A little World War II airplane combat. Um but that's what's on on schedule next. Uh, I'm going to take. I'm going to turn my mic off. I'm hosting that. I'll turn my mic off for uh, maybe about five minutes. I need to refresh a drink, uh, and I'll be uh, uh, give me five, and we'll get started. You guys are good with that? We got Bob, Chuck, and sounds good. Stickman in D.C. How are you, Stickman? Yeah, that's fine. Fine with me. Okay. Okay. Stickman, can you hear me? All right. Well, Stickman in DC is still on. He might be. Uh, he might uh, still be in from the last session. So I'll be back in about five minutes, Bob, Chuck, and we'll get started. Okay. Mic off.
Mic on. All right, we are in. It's time to shoot down some airplanes. Okay. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yeah, I can. Good, good, good. Okay. Very well. Yep. Right, excellent. Okay. So in the WG02 text chat, I have uh, put a link for the tonight's Check Your Six game. Uh, it was posted at 4.40 p.m. on roll for a uh, link to roll 20. At, uh, the last few letters are GWGMUW. So if you want to click on that, if you have not uh, already done that, that will put you into roll 20. And you'll need to create a free account on World 20 if you don't have one. <clears throat> yeah, let me switch my windows around a little bit. 